Um, hello, it's a great pleasure to be back in Boston. Thrilled to see you all here tonight. So um, the movie opened in England last weekend. It's number one in the box office. <laughs> so my, my challenge to you all is that we want the movie to be number one in America this coming weekend. So if you enjoy it, please spread the word, tell your friends and family, uh, come and see it again. Um, so, uh, yeah, very exciting time. So I'm uh, just going to introduce you to the, the key players. Um, we haven't brought the entire cast of Downton. I only brought the ones that I really like. <laughs> <laughs> only a few. <laughs> so um, without further ado, I want to introduce you to uh, the man who created the television series, and I'm delighted to say also wrote the screenplay for this movie, uh, my friend, partner, Julian Fellows. And we are, we are joined um, by our producing partner, Liz Truebridge. If the film's really popular, and maybe one day we ever even did another film, this actress, <laughs> the, the first actress that I'm gonna introduce you to has promised that she really is going to learn how to cook for the next film, <laughs> Leslie Nickel. And here to keep all of us in check tonight, keys around her waist, Phyllis Logan. And I promise you, looking even more glamorous than the New York premiere last night, Laura Carmichael. I just want to say thank you very much for coming and for supporting the film. Uh, we're very grateful. <laughs> and and uh, it has been an extraordinary journey, as you can obviously imagine. I mean, Gareth had the idea, and I started writing 11 years ago. And, and the cast came aboard 10 years ago. I mean, we've covered 17 years in the story, 1912 to 19, no, 15 years to 1927. And I mean, we've taken 10 years to do it, so there's practically no difference in the fictional time and the real. But anyway, we've had a lot of fun over the years making these shows uh, and making this film. And we just hope that you have as much fun watching it. Thank you very much indeed. Enjoy the film. Welcome to the Coolidge. Welcome to Boston. Can we, can we just start by saying what a beautiful theatre this is? Yes, it's lovely. Wow. It's okay, haunted, but lovely. Very haunted. <laughs> but, you know, thank you so much for being here. I, I feel like Mosley at, the, at the, the dinner with the king and queen. I, I'm such a fan. Um, I, uh, I guess on that note, did you guys ever anticipate what a phenomenon this would be in America and just the sheer level of fandom here in America, did you ever, did you see it coming, um, the, the crossover? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't see any of it coming. I mean, the truth is we, we all, I think, believed in the show. I think we all thought it was a good show and we had a good cast and, and it had come together very well. But I mean, you, you have no security in this industry. You never know what will fly. And I had to write the last episode of the first series so that if there were no more, it could be the end. And we had that thing of him coming out and saying, I regret to inform you, we're at war with Germany because you know, then everyone would know that First World War made a big difference to everything. And that could be a sort of ending. And it, it wasn't until later than that that we got the commission for the second series. And we're so glad you did. Um, so when did you begin plotting the return of Downton Abbey? Was it when the series was still underway or did the movie come up sort of after the fact? And, and why a movie versus you know, a TV special? I'm so glad just to see the costumes in the, in the house on, on the big screen. It gave me chills to see it again. Um, but how did it uh, evolve? Well, I, I think um, we, about season four, we re-upped all of the actors for a further two seasons. And I probably thought it, we'd struggle to keep everyone together after that. People wanted to go off and do other things. And, and we also had a sense that we didn't want to be one of those shows that you know, ran for 
10 years and the last two years, everyone's sick of it. You know, we just didn't want to do that. We wanted to quit while we were ahead. And we thought, you know, six was arguably a year or two early, but, you know, we knew we had more to do. And we all had a sense, you know, certainly by season three, this was a huge global show. It was in every, by this point, it's in every country in the world, which is pretty unusual for any television show to have that kind of reach. And because it always had great production values, it always, you know, for television, it really filled that screen. There were every, we, we, it wasn't a sort of precinct show where they were just in the office one week and at home the next week. It was balls and, and cricket matches and going to Buckingham Palace and all this one after the other. So we thought it really could fill a bigger screen. And when we announced the TV show was ending, it was a way to say to the fans, and I hope most of you are big fans because you've stayed after the end of the movie, um, <laughs> that, it, that although the television show was ending and that was a sad thing, that we, we really promised that we'd do our, our utmost to bring a movie back a few years later. And, so it was about the kind of contract with you guys as the fans. Yeah, and there are, there are so many characters in the series. Uh, Julian, did you find it difficult to balance? Because I thought one of the remarkable things about the film is I, I didn't feel, as a fan, I didn't feel it all, all shortchanged. I felt like I'll, each character got its due. But was it difficult to write it so that everyone, you, you got sort of screen time with everyone within such a short period of time? Well, that, I mean, that was the challenge, really. I mean, that that... You know, in an, in an episode of a series, not everyone expects a big story. They, they hope for two or three in the series, but not every week. Uh, and, and also, you don't have to finish every story every week. You can take them on for two weeks, three weeks, five weeks, the whole season. And a movie is different. Uh, everyone who's in it, I think, has to have a narrative reason for being there. And I also obviously realize that all of the stories of the film must be resolved within the film. And, and we'd always had in Downton this thing of lots of stories going on simultaneously. That was the style of the show, uh, which we were very keen would continue with the film. And it wouldn't be suddenly a linear narrative with just one thing happening and then that's it and everyone goes home. And, and so we didn't want to do that. But, it, you know, uh, I mean, there is a certain amount of kind of shoehorning it in. And, and I felt that we had as many of our characters in the film as we could serve. Service. And one or two people had to get left out, uh, but which was a sadness, actually, because some of them were, were marvelous. But, uh, you know, in the end, there's a kind of limit to how many people you can get into the lift. <laughs> and, 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 and that was it, really. Well, you did a good job of fitting them all into the lift. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. For Phyllis and Leslie, how, how did it feel for you guys to return to it? Because it had been a couple of years since you'd seen the house and been on set. How did, how did it feel to return to all that? Did you? Well, I don't know. Had you been up there? Um, oh, I didn't go to the house what? at all, actually. Hmm? I mean, in the film, I didn't go to the house at all. No, no, no. But before, what, when the seasons finished yeah. all together, um, didn't you go and visit? Once, I think. You I think I opened the village faint or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I popped in, yeah. But going back to do the, the, this story was like going home. That's what it was like. Yeah, it um, was... We, we'd kept in touch with each other. It wasn't like we hadn't seen each other in the, in the intervening years, but um, putting the costumes on, and of course we have Julian's dialogue, and he, he always gets it spot on, so it, there wasn't a difficulty. It was just a joy to do it. And there had been a, a pressure for it to happen for quite a long time. It was like, thank God for that. <laughs> yeah, it was like a school reunion. It was. It was yeah. lovely. Uh, no, I'm glad you, you mentioned that you've, you've kept in touch, because one of the things that has always struck me about the series, especially amongst the female characters, is there's a real sense of camaraderie. And also, because um, it, it takes place during an era where the options for women were really limited, but you're both playing women who are not to be trifled with. You're, you're in charge. And I'm wondering, I guess, behind the scenes, sort of how did you create that? I mean, were, did you spend a lot of time together off set or... How did well, you create we, that we sort set? of did, but that, that, that was just gradual. Well, I mean, it's a credit to Julian that not only does he write wonderful stories, but he writes wonderful characters and particularly wonderful women characters, you know, which is it's unusual. <laughs> All my life, I've been surrounded by very, very strong women. My mother, my grandmother, my great aunts, my wife, 
are all as strong as an ox. And, and I'm one of those men that gets worried by weak women. I, I, I'm no good at clinging vines. I like women who tell me what the answer is. <laughs> What comes through on screen. Um, another um, one of my favorite parts of the film was, was the romance between Barrow and, and the member of, of the Royal Household. Um, I, I thought that was terrific. And I, I think his evolution as a character is really interesting because he, he started out kind of villainous and then your empathy for him grows o over the seasons. Um, and I thought it was interesting because it, it's kind of in parallel if you look at the past decade in the UK, in the US, marriage equality, gay rights. I was, did any of that sort of filter into your betrayal of, of Barrow, or was that sort of always how you intended that character arc? Well, I, I always like writing characters where you change your mind about them. Um, just as I, I like writing arguments when the first one speaks and you agree with them and then the second one speaks and you think, oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> and and, and I, I love that. Uh, and what I did feel about having a gay character was, you know, every, we're very gloom and doom period at the moment and everything's terrible and everything's awful. But some things are much better than they used to be. Yeah. And, you know, when I had the first gay story, it was a real story about Barrow, when he kissed the footman, do you remember? And he, yeah. and he was threatened with the police and all that stuff. I was getting letters from people saying, are you seriously trying to suggest that homosexuality was a crime in 1913? 1913? It was a crime in 1963. And, you know, I thought it was useful that particularly the young should be reminded of how far we have come. And in this film, well, I, I you know, and, and we're dealing here with the 1920s. It's not like the 1950s, where it was still illegal, but it was generally kind of understood that it was nearly over. This is not that period. And there weren't gay bars that were also, you know, covered in red plush and a lovely padded bar at one end and everyone drinking and having a lovely time. That was not it. These gatherings, you had to be able to up sticks and move. And they were in storehouses, warehouses. They, they had to be in places where you could just, as soon as the police got onto it, you could move. And I hope that that comes through, that even though Thomas is for once having a bit of fun, which he's kind of earned after six years, <laughs> but for once he's having a bit of fun. But nevertheless, this, is not a, a, this was not a fun Culture, this was a dangerous culture, and you were living on the edge all the time. And we quite deliberately intercut it with the royal banquet, where everything is marvelous and, you know, and everything. And, and, and there is this other world going on. And I hope, I don't want to sound too heavy because my main wish for the film is that people have a good two hours, you know, and they go home happy. But I, I hope there is something in there that makes some people think. It, it absolutely did. And I think in terms of the outside world, you, you sort of touched upon this. I mean, we are at a, at a very divided time right now. Was, was that also as you, um, there's, some, there's something comforting about Downton at the end, the, the end note of Downton's chill, you know, carry on. Was that, did that filter into the, the process at all of writing the film? Well, it's, it's, it's a slight, illusion that it was a period of calm and serenity, because actually it wasn't particularly. I mean, the role of women was changing completely, organized labor was changing, and even without politics, transport was changing, the movies had arrived, cars, everything was changing. So it was a period of great adjustment, but as a society, as a culture, they clung, clung on to certain norms, the way they dressed, the way they addressed each other, the, their sort of politeness. And I think we do perhaps have a certain nostalgia for that more polite generation and world. I mean, people now, particularly with the coming of the internet and all these internet Twitter things that I don't understand, uh, I, I mean, this, this business of being anonymous in your rude comments about people and attacking people anonymously has, has made a very angry feeling around so much of modern life. Everyone is so angry, everyone's so offended all the time. And I think there is perhaps a slightly nostalgic appeal because it was a different time when it was gentler. 
And one of the things, so the, I, I think Kathy mentioned the exhibit is still going at, at the Park Plaza in Boston until the, the 29th. I was really struck by just the level of historic detail and accuracy. How do you, as, as producers or creators, uh, how do you even go about researching that and, and making sure everything is just so from the place settings to the, to the meals, to the costumes? I mean, we have a, a wonderful historical advisor called Alistair Bruce, who we all dub the Oracle. Because, um, as Hugh would say, if he, if he doesn't know, he does a jolly good job at making it up. Because he, and he just tells us he knows so much and he is, he is a real polymath. He is um, equerry to Prince Edward. Edward, yeah. He is the Sky's royal and news commentator. He's the only person that can teach women how to curtsy and men how to salute. <laughs> I mean, he is absolutely extraordinary. He's, he's now become governor of Edinburgh Castle, but he is, um, he, he's on set most of the time. And when he's not there, particularly for the movie, we had uh, a retired butler from Buckingham Palace come for the big dinner scenes to tell us precisely how things were. So we do go, sorry? Oh no, I mean, Alistair is there talking to costume. Um, he advises, uh, and military details, of course. I mean, that's so important. I love that um, detail, actually, that Violet's um, tiara is mid-Victorian. Cora's is late Victorian. And the young women, you know, Mary and, and um, Edith, both have tiaras from the 1910s and the 20s. And, and that's, that's completely Alice there, isn't it, really? I mean, I know it's also Anna. But I love the way they work together. And there's a kind of narrative in all the detail, which I think works very well. And we had people from Asprey's standing in the wings, waiting to take the tiaras back. <laughs> <laughs> They were lovely tiaras. Um, finally, I, is, is there any chance we might see another Downton movie? And can we launch a fan campaign to, to cure Violet of whatever disease she has? Oh. I bet you've never thought of that. <laughs> um, who knows? I mean, the fans, the fans, I mean, we've all been used to watching this at home in our, in our living rooms. And this is now, I mean, we're fans, you know? Like, we're fans as well. We, We've devoted our lives to making this thing for 10 years, and we're, we're fans in a way. Um, the fans have to go out and see the movie. If, if it, it's a big leap to take a television show and, and, and go into theatres. And, and if that worked, then we, you know, we, we loved coming back to make... We shot this about uh, uh, you know, 10, 11 months ago now. We, you know, we loved getting back together and doing it. I think there would be an appetite. As I say, Leslie's offered to learn to go on... A cookery class. I'll do anything, absolutely anything. <laughs> Make a cook of you yet. Yes. Well, thank you very much. And again, um, Downton Abbey movie will be playing at the Coolidge Corner Theater beginning this weekend. So tell all your friends to come see it so we can get that sequel. Thank you all for being here. Thank you very much.